Welcome. Thanks for coming this early in the morning on a Saturday. I wasn't very happy about that, but um, <laughs> okay. Um, so my name is Jens Kielers and I work on the Google Cloud Platform team. I'm based here in Berlin, so um, I'm never far away. So if you actually want to build something on the Google Cloud Platform, you will find me around. Uh, you can find me in the Google office. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm now responsible for, for building solutions for our customers in uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And I've been in Google now for six years. And I started as a network engineer, um, working on the global network of Google between the data centers. And uh, that's where I will also go a little bit into the beginning of this talk. I will go into the Google Cloud infrastructure as a whole, and maybe a little bit in the background of where I'm coming from. And, and why I think this is super exciting. Um, maybe I can get a quick show of hands, because sometimes we're a bit mistaken. How many people here are using any of the Google Cloud Platform products already, or at least have played around with it? OK, that's about half. So um, you can go, no. Uh, <laughs> I hope there's still something new. Um, I'm, I'm trying to go a little bit into all the products, uh, show quick very quick demos just to show how easy this gets started. A very important thing about Google is always being fast and uh, that that's one of the things we try to work on, making the startup uh, very, very easy, very, very fast and reducing the friction until you can get going basically. It should, once you have a Google account, you're ready to go uh, and start building your app today. That's also, when we have hackathons, uh, people are really happy because it's not like, okay, you wait 24 hours until your account is approved and whatever. Um, you can start right away. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, uh, go, go a little bit about the details later. But uh, let me start up with the Google Cloud infrastructure. And uh, I always like to start with a picture of the Google Data Center because um, this is what I've been working for for three years. and. Uh, we think for the past 15 years, we've built the highest quality cloud infrastructure on the planet, and, and we're the only one who can do it at such, such a massive scale. And we've done that for our own products, like uh, Gmail uh, and YouTube, uh, serving all these videos, etc. And I think this picture shows very much the, the scale we're looking at. And I just have to say, this is obviously only one of the rooms in our data center. We need at least a second one to have a little bit of disaster recovery space. And uh, it just shows what amazing thing we've built over the year. We're one of the largest server manufacturers uh, in the world. Um, we're running probably, depending on how you count, the biggest network in the world. And we've been doing that for our own products uh, just because we need this massive computing power. And, and we realized how much more you can do once you have access to that power. And now with Google Cloud Platform, we want that everyone can basically work like a Google software engineer. Because it used to be, oh, you work at Google, you have a fun, nice 20% project, and you need 1,000 machines. OK, you can have 1,000 machines. You can have 2,000 machines. Well, maybe not permanently, then you need to follow a little bit more of a, of, a, of a process. But if you just want to try something out, it should be very easy. And with Cloud Platform, it should be the same way. We're not fully there yet, but that's the vision. Anyone can be a Google software engineer. Um, we're still investing. Just uh, if you look at the news over the past year, we see there's 3 billion more roughly more investments in data center infrastructure we've, which we've announced. And uh, so we're not done yet. Um, this slide is what I'm personally always very involved in because it only shows a small part of Google's global network. It shows the network between our data centers, our, our major data centers. And we've rolled this out as an open flow network now. Open flow is some kind of technology you use for software defined networking. And uh, it's been developed by the University of Stanford over the last couple of years. And last year, we've announced at a conference that, that we're running our production traffic between the data centers on OpenFlow, which allows us to reduce the um, congestion on the links, but also increase the usage of the, the, the average usage of the links by centrally controlling where the data is going and actually integrating it with, within our systems 
which control where data is moved from A to B. So that was a big surprise for the community because OpenFlow is still under development. There's no hardware on the shelf which you can just roll out with uh, with OpenFlow on it. All the major um, hardware manufacturers are talking about it, but they don't really want to go ahead because they kind of don't want to lose their revenue stream. So this is this is something we just went ahead and did it. And it, it's great to work in a company where you can do just that. Um, obviously, this is not our whole network. We have um, a large, larger network with points of presence on all five continents in Africa, where I worked for a while for the Google infrastructure, in Asia, in South America, North America, Australia. And uh, the network's built for speed because it was built for our own products and we very quickly noticed, especially with the search engine, the faster you get results, the better you interact, the better is the user experience, the better it is for us as well. And uh, we're using exactly the same network to power our customers. So it's, um, it's not that you send something from from uh, your your machine in in the U.S. to Europe that it goes out to the internet. It follows some some weird path which is not controlled, and and it finally enters your your other VM through the public internet. All all the traffic stays on our fiber network if if you run it globally between our between your instances. On the software side, we see the same. Um, we always try to be a little bit ahead, which you can see that 2003 and 2004, we already worked on DFS and MapReduce and published these as papers. And now people are talking about Hadoop FS and MapReduce and Hadoop. And this is seen as very new technology, but we've gained experience over many years in that. Um, Google Big Table is the paper published in 2006. Right now, this is probably the biggest NoSQL database in the world. And if you use App Engine with the data store, you're building straight on top of Google Big Table. So you're making use of that power and the seven extra years basically of engineering going into that. Um, 2008, we, we published a paper about Dremel, our, our data analysis system, and we've now opened it up with Google BigQuery. And Spanner and Colossus are our newest technology for databases and file systems, so it just shows like where the way is going for external products, but with some of the cloud platform products, you already basically make use of, of these new technologies. But uh, I'll just brush over this slide, should be much new. Um, you all hear infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, just, just to clarify, software as a service, so Google Apps is not part of the cloud platform. It's also a cloud product, also by Google, but we talk about the developer products, we talk about infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Now, I want to go very, very quickly in all the products and uh, don't, uh, I'll brush over this because uh, I have like small demos for all the, for all the tools, but uh, basically we, we try to um, divide our services in computing, storage, and app services. On the computing side, we have App Engine. Great talk this afternoon about App Engine. Really, you should see them. Um, Raphael, great Ninja framework. Jerome, Snap Engage, great use case. So that's definitely something to learn. So I'll just very quick, quickly brush over that because we have lots on that. Compute Engine, our infrastructure as a service product where you build up uh, virtual machines in the cloud. Doesn't sound like much new, but again, we worked on the little things. We worked on speed, we worked on performance consistency, and we worked on having, making use of that great network and having that between the instances globally. So, so these little things. On the storage side, we have cloud storage, op um, which is an object store, can store huge objects. Um, we have as a relational database, Google Cloud SQL, which is a MySQL in the cloud. Um, and as I talked about, the data store, which is based on Bigtable or NoSQL database. Persistent disks is like our last storage thing. You, you attach them to Compute Engine instances. It works like a hard drive. Yeah. However, you can detach it from one instance, you can attach it to another one, or you can shut down your computer engine instances and keep your disk for, for a later stage, and you only pay for the storage. 
that's a, another theme of Google Cloud Platform is pay as you go. You always only pay for what you use. And we try to hold it on based on resource consumption. So basically, how much computing is it for us? That's, ba that's the basis for what you should pay. Um, last BigQuery is our big data analysis tool. I think it's one of the most exciting, if not the most exciting part of Google Plat Cloud Platform because there's really nothing like it out there and it allows you to query massive data sets very, very quickly. Um, Google Cloud Endpoint is, based, uh, is working on top of App Engine and uh, if you're a front-end programmer, you will love it uh, because you just write your, your mobile app or your web app and you just write a little bit of back-end code and you can um, you can um, open up a RESTful API and the whole authentication scheme, etc., is done for you. Um, now let's go a little bit of, yeah. So use cases, anything, but we realized um, anything which needs to scale fast or needs to scale massively is, is best for us. So massive storage, like online backup, Mobile backends where you need to scale to many users quickly. You might not know before how many users you have. Same is true for gaming. Um, Rovio loves us. Um, they have the Angry Birds on Facebook and Chrome running on, on Google App Engine. And uh, obviously in the big data world, it's something we talk about as well with sometimes more traditional companies, sometimes online retailers. Now let's jump in. Um, I don't want to really go too much into these uh, details, so I more or less want to jump right into demos. Uh, Compute Engine, it's Linux VMs, um, but for most people it's a little bit important to see how fast can I get going, how fast can I log into a VM and install my software, and I just want to try to do this here and do it on a Chromebook, which is <laughs> always a little bit of uh, interesting because uh, it, it still works. So let me jump here into the Google Cloud Console. So basically once you uh, go on Google Cloud, on cloud google.com slash console, uh, put in your billing information, that's where you should end up in. And it's a very, quite clean UI. You can see a little bit of what's happened during the past day. Um, some very basic monitoring. And if you go to Compute Engine, it's basically just a little, you, cl you click on your instance, you give it a name, let's call it DevSBillin maybe. Um, cool thing is you can give it tags and me metadata, that's something, um, you give it some keys and value store or, or you give it some comma separated tags and you can query these directly from the machine. So if you run Puppet or, or something like that to automatically install your machine, you just query those with an HTTP request and based on that you can take different actions. Um, you can select if you want it in Europe or the US, I'll leave it in Europe now. You can select the operating system, at the moment we have Debian and CentOS. Um, and what I find really cool, UI is great, but you don't want to do that later if you want to set up hundreds of machines. You can right away see how do I do this in the command line and how would I do a REST call which creates this machine? So you can work around that, then you can go into the docs, change the little things around, etc. But uh, it, it makes it quite frictionless. So let me create this machine. Takes a few seconds. Um, so what steps done? Okay. Um, so there's my machine, it already has an IP, it's still booting up, but hopefully by the, by the time I copy this IP, well, it's already booted up now. I'll copy and paste, should work. 834.222.138, I can uh, <laughs> do that quicker that way. Now when I now put in a, that's not it, 834.222.138, is that right? Use my SSH key, connect. Oh, great. <laughs> Post key. Okay, let me. I re reuse the IP. Um, that's 
that's quite difficult to get out of the Chrome SSH uh, client that needs a little bit of work. So let me create another instance just to get a second IP. <laughs> Okay, that's my new instance, 221.125, hopefully I never had this IP before, looks better except the machine is not booted yet, <laughs> so let me just try to reconnect, looks better, I enter my SSH password and I'm logged in and I can start installing software, so let me install a web server, and maybe I need that later in my SQL client. Alright, it's starting to, to install that, and at the same time let me go back to the console and uh, open up the firewall for the HTTP service, because uh, by default we only open SSH, so bit just on the network, I choose the default network, which this machine is on when I didn't change anything. Oh, I actually still have to remove them yesterday, but if I would um, create a new. I create a new firewall rule, call it HTTP or whatever. Source IP any, protocol TCP port 80. That opens up the firewall. Oh, okay. And there we go. If I use the same IP for my instance now, 834 121 I get the, well, WMD full web server page. So it took me roughly two, three minutes to set up um, an instance. And I think that's really cool. Um, now, one instance is cool, maybe 100 instances is even cooler. So we have a little script where you can set that up from Google App Engine. Let me start up 100 machines and let me not bore you while these are starting up because the timer is going. We'll, ta we'll take a look after I go through the slides um, how long it took. So I talked about most of, the, of this. You can boot within minutes. You can use disks of any size, you only pay for the disk size you use, and as I said, performance consistency. You don't create a disk, check the speed, throw it away, create another disk, check the speed, okay, this one's good. Uh, you, you don't strap together disks, you should get good and consistent performance on the disks all the time. Um, and we have advanced networking op options, you just saw the basic package filter you can put in as a firewall if you want more, or if you want to run a VPN, you can use that using our advanced networking options. I talked very quickly about instance metadata. You can also, when you create a machine, already give it a startup script to, to automatically install it, or you can just create snapshots of your machines and have basically a, a ready um, image sitting there for, for quickly setting up your machine and again and again from a snapshot. Um, load balancing. We just rolled that out. Uh, we rolling out new features every couple of weeks, and uh, it's great because uh, it's based on the same load balance that Google uses, so it can actually handle any load. Uh, you should be able to to run a big service, so you don't and and you don't have to think about it before. It scales very quickly, automatically, on, on however much capacity you need. You don't have to say how many load balancing instances you need. So, so that's another thing. So let me quickly jump back. Hope that all these hundred um, the machines, yes, they were all set up and for all of them it took fifty three seconds until all of them were booted and ready to SSH into them. So Together with sub-hour billing, you only pay 10 minutes minimum for machines, and then it's by the minute. You can run huge workloads very, very quickly. That, that's uh, something which also differentiates us a little bit, because um, sometimes you just want to run a workload, and you don't want to wait a full hour to finish, so you just push it to a few more machines, at least if your, your software runs great in parallel. 
and that way you can uh, run huge workloads. For example, the TerraSort map bar run that on our machines, and um, they just needed 4,000 cores, and the whole thing ran, well, after setting up the Hadoop cluster, 56 seconds to run the job. Setting up Hadoop might maybe take the 10 minutes or whatever, so you pay 10 minutes for 4,000 cores. You see here it's $600 an hour, so you can basically break the TerraSort world record for around $60, while previously people set up clusters in their basement, took months to do, and uh, cost a huge amount of money. They also broke the, the minutes sort record later, but they just didn't produce such a nice video which shows how the whole, whole the thing runs. So that's why we show the TerraSort record. They made a few talks, so it's quite impressive to um, um, to 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 look at these um, on how they set it up. Let's move from compute engine to app engine. Now, if you don't want to manage servers, operating systems yourself, if you really just want to code, app engine might be the thing you you actually want to do. Because the interesting thing here is it scales your app automatically and infinitely. And when we say infinitely, we mean infinitely. Um, we had the Royal Wedding website run on uh, Google App Engine. The Vatican switched to Google App Engine just before the last Pope election. They say it was by chance. I don't know what happened if, if they knew something before the, the public. But um, they came to us and thought they need more. Um, they need to scale faster on their website based on their usage in case something happens. Um, you can write in four languages, Java, Python, PHP, Go. Um, I think Jerome's talk is on Java, um, Raphael's talk is on Java too. Um, so you, if you're a Java developer, you're well taken care of, but writing in the other languages is great too. Especially with PHP, now you have uh, Cloud SQL, it's very easy to port applications over. Um, you have powerful services, and I think Jerome will go a bit into details. And the data store is based on Google Big Table, which allows you to scale just the same way. So you don't have to think about database, how much memory do you need, how much um, space do you need for your database, how will it react if I put suddenly twice, three times the data, and it should return it will return the data consistently fast. Um, another thing which for startups is very interesting when talking about App Engine is the traffic splitting and versioning, I think. Because, um, well, you can test on your local development server first, but then once, you, once you're somewhat happy, you can just deploy it on uh, either an extra instance or an extra version, and you can try around um, if everything works, um, either on your live data or on new data, test data, and you don't have to, to pay much for that because it's only pay as you use. Since your test instance will be used by one user, um, it should either fit into the free quota or cost not much at all. So, so that's what people find very interesting using, using test instances. Um, if you want to try out App Engine and you don't want to download the SDK and you don't want to uh, install the Eclipse plugin and all of that, we rolled out something called the Cloud Playground. Um, and it basically allows you to import from either GitHub or from some of our examples um, code, code straight into a web-based IDE. Um, I used our last co code lab, basically. Let me make a copy of that. Um, that's where we built a meme generator on App Engine, took a couple of hours, and I find it really exciting um, because what happened there was the people who were writing the meme generator they started filling uh, their memes with, uh, with text, and let me show you a little bit of the code. I don't know how much you can see. It's basically roughly 200 lines of code for the whole thing, including integration with Google accounts and saving to the data store and perma URLs and all of that. Um, and you can see once you play around with the Cloud Playground, it starts running it on App Engine on a shared version immediately. Um, so what happened to, during our code lab is the guys were writing the code, they were adding features. One guy 
created a meme and sent it to his wife or something. The wife liked it, the wife sent it on. Um, they started using this tool. Um, and before, at the end of the code lab, we were like, well, we want to shut down the code lab environment, but these, uh, this one application is already being used by a couple of people. So it just shows how quickly something can go viral. And um, uh, let me see. And this should, uh, yeah. And as soon as you basically put in text, it works on the image using our image API. It, it can overlay the text and all of that. Um, just shows how easy it is, and it already scales. You have all this uh, permanent URLs, and and you could keep it running and start the marketing this. Well, maybe you want to put a little bit of a different CSS on it that looks a bit nicer, but the application as a whole is running and it's not so far from some very successful applications. Um, now, many of you actually don't want to develop something like that on the back end. Many of you are front end developers. Um, so we develop Google Cloud Endpoints, which makes it easier to create powerful backends which you can connect to with your Android, iOS, or web applications. So what you do is you write simple code, data storage, so maybe a little bit of computing on the data, um, all of that. Um, just, just a simple data model, then you annotate your code, and uh, it generates a RESTful API which is completely standard, you can use it from any client, but for Android, iOS, and uh, web, also JavaScript, we generate client libraries, so you can automate, uh, you can just by a method call, you can connect through that, to, to that uh, data you, or, or method you just created on the server. So this is kind of how it looks on the Java side. Um, here I made an example with a social network where you send an invitation between users, and you just write this, met this method and you, you annotate the code with the AP API method and it creates that RESTful API. And then once you create that Java client library, you only need to send a single method call and it takes care of this OAuth authentication between the app and the server. It takes care of the, um, the, the REST client, etc. and and it's just like a remote procedure call, so it, it's, it's very, very easy to use. Um, if you only need the backend, which is a simple key value store, you want to store a high score, you want to store, I don't know, the preferences of the user or something, and we even have a, a version where you don't have to write any code at all, we have a generic backend, you can deploy with one click on up engine. you have a client library, you just put in your IDs, and uh, it runs an app and then it still scales infinitely. So if you just if you have a successful app and you need some simple storage for it, or some simple backend store, this is what you could use, and it works for iOS and Android now. Okay. Um, now Google Cloud Storage. I don't want to talk too much about it. Five terabyte objects in size. You can use any size of object. And then the difference is really on network. And I think I talked enough about our network. I think it's great um, that we, it's, it's the same speed you, you used from Google. It's one of the, the uh, biggest networks in the world. And uh, you can use up our cache. So the same caching system we use for YouTube or maps, you can make use of if you store public uh, uh, objects on Google Cloud Storage. Another good thing is, you can have read after write consistency, which means uh, you write a new version of your object. If you read it again, you get the new version for sure. It doesn't mean there could be for a while some old object returned, and some developers have been bitten by that with other um, <laughs> with other offerings. Um, yeah, if you can run static sites, we have a cheaper option if you don't need very very high availability and. General, we have a 99.9% .9 SLA. On the reduced availability version, we have a 99% SLA. And it 
can just save you a lot of costs for if you, let's say, you have just backup jobs or something not mission critical. Um, I won't show a demo of cloud storage because it's very, very boring, but uh, <laughs> try it out yourself. Um, cloud SQL, if you use MySQL, um, this is a simple way to run a fully relational database in the cloud, uh, and it's completely managed. It's geographically redundant, so one of our data centers can go down, it will still work. Um, it's uh, highly secure storage, so um, nothing nothing will go away. And the great thing there is it's, it's one of the very few, if not only, offering where you pay MySQL as well by the hour. So we, we shut down your instance automatically if it's not used. So it's, it's, for example, as a platform, if, if you're offering a platform as a service and that has a MySQL backend, but not all of the customers use it all the time, you can have small instances for every customer and only when they use you are paying for them, well, and maybe they are paying for them. Um, let me quickly sh show you in the console how this looks like. Now, if I go on Google Cloud SQL, it's about the same, should be very frictionless, create a new instance, DB maybe. Um, I can say I want it in the EU as well. You can select the size of your database based on the RAM you want for your database. And the cheapest one is two and a half cents per hour. So it's really an easy way to get started. So once I create this, it should be even faster than the computer engine instance to be created. Um, should be already running, and uh, it's being set up. Done. So now I can uh, import some starter data. Let's say I have sample data on, on Cloud SQL. So this is how you see the, the we tried to put some connection between all the products. So, so if you use all of them, it, it will get very, very easy to work with them. Now you can see the, the SQL has been already um, created. Now somewhere I should have my SSH window. And, oh, I do need to create, I forgot to give this instance a public IP because we just rolled out um, we just rolled a pop, um, wire protocol on MySQL, so you can now use it outside of App Engine, outside of Compute Engine. So I want to assign an IP address and allow connections from anywhere. You should probably not do this at home. Uh, and I can see this is the IP. My S2. MySQL. Oh. I need to set a root password. I won't tell you because otherwise when you will use my database. Um, and I'm in. You can see my databases. I just imported that uh, world example database. Um, and I can run with it, can use it from anywhere, just like a MySQL database. So within minutes again, you can get started. Now I can shut it down again, did my test, and don't get charged anymore. Actually, I don't even need to shut it down. As soon as I exit here, I don't have any connection to it. In 15, 30 minutes, it should shut down automatically. And when I want to use it again, it will set up again within a few seconds. Last but not least, BigQuery. Um, I think, as I said, one of the most exciting products because it uh, uh, allows you to query massive data sets, billions of rows, trillions of rows, um, and it always returns um, results within a few seconds. You put your, your data in a um, table-like structure. It can be a JSON, mostly, basically. Uh, and you use just the SQL language to query it. Um, 
and it stores it based on columns on a distributed architecture and makes basically use of our massive computing power of, of computing the results in parallel. Um, so if you're interested in how it actually works, read the German white paper, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. It's, uh, yeah, so we've been using that for, for quite a few years to run over, over our log files. Um, most of our customers I talk to, they think, oh, this is super exciting. Many of them that don't actually have the data um, to make it useful because uh, getting billions of data, rows of data or trillions of rows, it's something you didn't collect in the past because you couldn't use it anyway. So now you have to rethink your data collection. Um, something which wasn't possible before might be possible now. Um, and to demo this, I used um, our public data set. Um, we have a project together with some university called Measurement Lab um, where where users can measure their internet speed, can, can, can detect if there's any firewalls or proxies or bandwidth limiting or torrent limiting uh, things in between. And uh, all, all this data is collected and it's publicized. So it's, it's a re researchers around the globe can use it to see how internet speeds are working around the world, how, um, which services are blocked most often, etc. Um, and this data is automatically exported to Google BigQuery. And I prepared a query about the, around the... Uh, no, that's not the one. Uh, around the, on the data set from... Well, let me make it bigger. So it's, it's based on all the data from September 2013, um, looking at the countries of all the clients who run tests on measurement lab. And I just group it by country and order it by country. Let's show the first, let's say 20. So it looks better on the chart. And you can see within Roughly three seconds, it searched through this, uh, I think it's around 200 billion rows per month. Uh, so, and it showed you, well, there were about 800 million connections from the US, around 700 million from Russia, 400 million from the, um, from the UK, etc. Um, so, it, it it gives you some insight very, very quickly, and any graphing library, you could use that now to graph that data, and, uh, and, and uh, basically um, use it to analyze more, and then you can dig deeper, and as you can see, it took me roughly three seconds, so if I realize, get some insight now, and I want to dig deeper, it's some very fast um, process. You don't always have to build new cubes or data cubes, so you have to think about, well, how long will this query take? Um, and again, you pay per what you use, so you only pay over the data queried. Well, actually, on, on these public MLEF data set, it's free, that's why it shows zero byte process, but basically you would pay um, based on how many gigabytes of data you query, and it's just cents per gigabyte. Um, this slide, I won't show this demo, but um, one of our partners put it all together and they built a, an up engine up which queries retail data they built for, um, for a client in Germany um, and same speed within a few seconds they can uh, graph uh, the, the retail data for a whole year of, of a major retail store. Um, took them around two weeks to create the app and most of the time was actually generating some fake data to, uh, to run the proof of concept. So once they did that, graphing that data and, and running the queries was quite quick. Um, nearly done, just want to talk very quickly about some of our customers, how they use it. 
Um, we have three million active applications that are cloud. I just want to talk about three of them. Um, one of the most exciting for me is the Eurovision. Um, uh, the second screen up for the Eurovision was run on Google Compute Engine this year. It was a small company from Cologne called Grand Centrix. And uh, they were running on another cloud um, a test and then wanted to bring up the second screen up, which they had been contracted for. They weren't happy with the performance. And uh, so they called us and they said, can, can we try this? And well, they set it up very quickly. They were happy with the performance. They ran this together with Scalar, and they served 50,000 requests a second during the show for voting in the second screen up. However, it was a very simple app. You could do voting, you could get a little bit of news about the context. There was not much more, because the European Broadcasting Union was a bit afraid that whatever they build will not scale, because all these other applications on TV often have problems, etc. So they wanted something simple. Now they saw this happening, and they saw the scale is working, they're very happy, and they want to make it bigger next year. And uh, our partner, Grand Centrix, they became big Google fans after running this. So now they want to use the whole shebang. They want to run this on App Engine. Um, they want to build this on Go. So for all the Go developers here, it might be interesting to get in touch with them. This could be one of the most exciting, biggest App Engine product uh, application ever build on Go. Yeah, and they're very happy to go to Copenhagen with this uh, for their Eurovision 2014. Um, Song Pop uh, is a very cool mobile game running on App Engine um, as a backend. There's a cool I.O. talk where, where they explain a little bit about the architecture and, and how they store the data and, and how the model looks like and to um, send song snippets to the users, they, um, they use Google Cloud Storage. And it's only small snippets for every user, but with 80 million users, it's 18 terabyte a day. So they really could get to the scale by, by running uh, on our infrastructure. And they, I think they talked about having three to five developers per team. So that's what it needs to, to build such a massively popular game. Um, Okay, I thought I had the third one, but no. Um, anyway, uh, for anyone who wants to try it out. And we use the mics at the video clip and record the questions. Yeah. There. Hey, uh, I've got a question about Cloud SQL, about the pricing. Um, you said that um, it is charged per hour. Is it like. Um, compute engine that you, you um, have a minimum of 10 minutes or something, or is it really, if I start an hour, I have to pay for it? If I remember right, it's actually per hour, if you start an hour. Um, no, it might be 15 minute increments, but I'd, I'd have to look that up again. Um, we also have an option, if you actually run 24 hour workload to, to prepay and get a discount on, on a, uh, well, on a, on a full workload. <laughs> Any other questions? There. Uh, hi. Uh, so with the uh, uh, data store, can I can play for free, yeah? And with the uh, data SQL, yeah, I can do it, actually. Is, uh, is there a uh, possibility to do this? So, we have Precoder right now on App Engine, and with that, with Data Store, Cloud Data Store as well. We don't have a free quarter on SQL, mm -hmm. but I mean, if you try and run at two and a half cents per hour, if you make sure that you don't run workloads overnight, you should be, you should be okay with small ones. Um, with the starter pack, um, come to me later, and I'd, I'd tell you something how you might be able to use that for Cloud SQL as well. <laughs> I think you can say, the start of the park is half app engine, half, half compute, engine. Engine. compute engine, exactly, yeah. So with Cloud SQL, usually you have to pay, um, same for Cloud Storage. Any more questions? Yeah, what do you still think about the next question? We have bathroom uh, now just around the corner there in the back. Uh, I think they left up some drink there, you don't want to, you know, to break the rain, otherwise no, uh, food and drinks will be on the other side. 
And we'll start at 11 sharp here with uh, Ben, who we should be coming shortly talking about, uh, yeah, about uh, open source development. All right. Uh, we have the last uh, yeah. question. Uh, uh, you said that uh, Google Engine is running uh, Java, Python, and uh, other, other languages. And uh, I, I just said actually Scala, and they have some really nice uh, performance optimizations based on the on the, uh, on the machine it's running on. Yeah. Uh, so do, is uh, Google actually planning to, to do some kind of optimizations for Scala, for instance? So we don't have any other languages announced yet. Um, what we did kind of announce um, is that we, um, or, 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 yeah, we're running some tests of integrating further App Engine and Compute Engine, and uh, like making a, com a complete product out of that, and that might um, make it able for us to, to launch new languages more rapidly, but we don't have any timeline announced yet. And I don't know which is the priority language next, because while we have four, we're still missing a few. People are asking for Ruby, people are asking for Scala, people are asking for C, Perl, um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, so might be coming at the moment you, you could use Compute Engine. I know that some people there have been running, yeah, exactly, yeah. I just could mention as well for the next uh, session in the other room. So we have uh, Martin from Google France talking about uh, for your Canary Eyes only CSS custom feature uh, in the HTML5 track. There will be uh, you enter the building, turn right through the cookie, and then at the very end over there. And the Android track, it's an uh, inject with a dagger. Dagger? Dagger? Dagger. Dagger. All right, so for you Android fans, uh, it's the main, main all over there. Further question for audience? Going once, twice. Thank you very much, Jens, for all Thank you. this great talk. And don't forget to post your photos or say how awesome this speaker is. It's always important. And we'd like our speaker, a little gift for you.